You can be seated. I was glad we sang a little longer. I uh, have my Bible marked for our Ephesians chapter 5 series tonight as we finally made it to some uh, crucial theological verses. All of them are, but when we talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, that's an entire uh, series built upon itself. And so, I, I really, to be honest, I was kind of looking forward to getting into that and all of that means. But uh, while we were singing that last little bit, I was just over there, and the Lord just nudged me a little bit different. Amen. Just wants me to go a little bit of a different direction tonight. And he laid a story on my heart, and really, it, it kind of started when I, when I talked about the people calling in uh, from around the country. And uh, I, I had this thought for a moment, and then we're sitting over there worshiping, and the Lord said, yeah, there's a whole story in the Bible about that. And the idea was, it's interesting that when you spend your life propping people up, God makes sure you're propped. When you live your life encouraging other people, you will find that God will go out of his way to make sure you live encouraged. And the Lord said, yeah, there's a whole story in the Bible about that. And so just for a few moments, just, just randomly, it's just on my heart. I just want to share it with you. I want you to go to Exodus chapter 17. Would you go there? Exodus chapter number 17. Maybe these, giving these monitors a little, little bit up here. I know my mic sounds a little bit different from what their mic was, but I'm still a little bit in the, uh, in the woods, in the swamp with my voice. And by the way, uh, we, we will, okay, we are determined, we will get through the live reading of the entire Bible for the rest of this month, okay? I promise you, we will get through it. So my goal right now is... Uh, as long as the secondary weather don't hit, I'm supposed to be in Texas. Uh, I never go anywhere for two days, but I had two churches that were like four hours apart. And so I thought, you know what? We'll just kill two birds with one stone, and we'll fly into one place and then drive to each one of them. So Thursday night and Friday night, I have to be in two different places in Texas. Uh, Lord willing, they won't cancel the flight. So what we will do is I'm planning, of course, by then, everything's going to be back in order and rolling for the tent. But even if it's just me and a, and a phone, all right, I'm going to start back on Saturday night. And then we're going to read every single night up to the Hope Crusade, which is the following Friday, right? So Friday the 26th and Saturday the 27th and Sunday morning the 28th. Don't forget we have the Hope Crusade. It is going to be so powerful. And uh, some of our best friends, some of our favorite ministers of the gospel are going to be there and we'll say a lot more about that this weekend and uh, show the graphic and all that kind of stuff. But we're going to read every single night. And then by then, we'll be well ahead. And then the next week, we'll finish out the New Testament and boom, right? We'll be done. We'll be on track. And everybody that said we couldn't do it, we're going to do it with a broke tent and with sickness, right? And with traveling. We're still going to pull it off. And that's over and above what me and a whole lot of you are, are, are doing just ourselves, right? I still want you on your own reading plan. That's just the live reading in the tent Bible plan. And so we'll start back Saturday night, and uh, I'll let everybody know what time, but Lord willing, it'll be like it has been at 7.30, uh, right after the devotional preaching time and the 6.33 prayer. All right, well, go for a few moments to Exodus chapter 17. Uh, I'm not going to rush myself, but I'm not going to preach long either, just because this is the first day that I've really... I've been able to even be out of bed and, uh, and walk around, and so I just, I just want to share uh, this story because it's on my heart, and I want it to encourage you the way when I've been reading it as of late, it's encouraged me. Exodus 17 and verse 1, and all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin, and after their journeyings, according to the commandment of the Lord, and they pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? He's like, Quit complaining. Stop. Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And by the way, this was a reoccurring problem in the life of these people. That they lived in continual drudgery of criticism. And by the way, that is no way to live your life. The most miserable time you will ever be is when you're hoping everyone else will be as miserable as you are. 
And they just kept on and kept on. By the way, I do find it fascinating, and we don't have time to develop this because it's, it's not where I'm going. I'm just reading through this whole text because it's, it's a beautiful text, and it's short, and I want you to get the context. You'll notice that when it says they complained against Moses, that Moses turned it around and said, in actuality, what you're doing is complaining against God. He's like, you're not hurting me one bit, but you are hurting yourself because you are p complaining against God. Verse 4, Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, what shall I do unto this people? They'd be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee the elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river. Take it in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb and thou shalt smite the rock and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of all the elders of Israel. Now, to you and I, we would say, Okay, case closed. My goodness, that is a massive miracle. That there's nothing else for God to do. What more supernatural works does he have to do to prove who he is, right? They've already gone through the Red Sea. They're already seeing manna. They're already seeing healings. They're already watching their clothes and their shoes literally grow as they walk. And, I mean, God's doing some unbelievable things. Moses just hit a rock and water came out of the middle of the rock. I mean, God is literally handing miracles to these people, like, on a daily basis. And they're still just meandering around, whining, wearing diapers, sucking on a pacifier, whine, whine, whine. And I'll be honest with you, some people will never be happy no matter what God does for them. That they can't. They, they just cannot allow themselves to be joyous. But you better know this, Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So when you are not strong, I wonder how much of the joy of the Lord do you have in your life because it's the strength that comes from the joy of the Lord that keeps you going every single day. And these people complain, complain, complain. The Bible calls it chiding. It's a very interesting King James word. It literally is what it sounds like. Just like little kids. They just keep on and keep on and keep on. If you got kids, say amen. You know how them little monsters can do. That's why they're called the children of Israel. They acted like babies, grown adults, acting like children. So God said, bring all the elders. I want to show you what I can do. Now watch this, verse 7. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Is God with us or is God not with us? Well, of course he is. He proved himself over and over for them, and he continually proves himself for us. But watch this, verse 8. Then came Amalek. That was one of their biggest thorns in the flesh in the entirety of their journeys. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. <clears throat> and Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out a man and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him. And he fought with Amalek. And watch this. Moses... Aaron and her went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Now stop and look at me for a moment for the immediate context. They're going to fight against the Amalekites. These were not small-numbered people, and these were not folks that did not know how to be bloodthirsty assassins. They were some of the worst people that they ever had to deal with. This was a crowd of people that knew how to go to war. And now Israel is going to have to fight against them because God said, I want you to go in and wipe them all out. So here is what happens in the context. Moses says to Aaron, I want you to choose certain people that you trust that can go with me. And tomorrow, while Joshua and the crew goes into the valley to fight, I'm going to go climb on top of a mountain. I'm going to hold up the rod of God in my hand. That rod, by the way, that split the waters of the Red Sea. The rod that he just used to smite the rock in Horeb to bring out the water. The rod that caused the waters to be turned to blood in the Nile River. Uh, the very rod that was thrown to the ground and became a serpent. And when the magicians of Egypt had their rods do the same thing, his rod ate up their rods. That rod that's in his hand. 
And so he said, I'm going to go to the top of the hill and I'm going to hold it up. Now, here's the principle that began to transpire. As long as Moses had the strength to hold up his hands, the people prevailed against the Amalekites. But when his hands came down, the people began to lose footing and lose the battle against the Amalekites. Does that make sense? So watch this. Verse number 12. <coughs> but Moses' hands were heavy. You ever notice that sometimes even in a worship service, it's hard to get through a whole song with your hands raised up. You at least got to shake that thing out a little bit, right? Imagine being one of the, the worship leaders. They're holding a microphone and, and, and switching back and forth and having to worship. Listen, sometimes your arms just get tired, right? And so Moses' hands were heavy. Now, I'm just going to stop for a minute. And, and, and you, you understand what that means. It, it's simple. It's scientific. But I feel like maybe the reason the Lord during that last little bit just wanted me to, to talk about this story is because in this room, some of you feel like this right here. Your hands are heavy. You feel like you're losing footing in a fight that you're in. You feel like you're losing ground with your kids. You're losing ground in your marriage. It feels like, man, there's always so much more month than there is money left. And your hands are getting heavy. And you're blaming yourself, you're blaming your spouse, you're blaming God, you're blaming your situation, you're blaming your circumstances, but ultimately you're in a battle and you feel like you just can't come up for air. You feel like you can't even breathe. You feel like you can't sleep at night, right? It's just like something else, another problem. What is the phone call going to be next? What's the next email that I'm going to receive? And sometimes life can be a barrage of one continual problem of the Amalekites coming against you after another, after another, after another. And let's just be honest. If you are human, and if you are, shout amen. amen. If you're AI, leave. But if you're human, that wears on you. Let me tell you something about fighting. Fighting will wear you out. You know, I'm not a professional fighter. I know you find that hard to believe. But uh, <laughs> let, me, let me tell you something I do know about fighting, right? I don't care how fast you are. I don't care how strong you are. I don't care how well-consisted your diet is. Y you can have a 24-pack. I mean, you can look all that. You can be a UFC SmackDown champion to the mat. But let me tell you something. If you cannot hold your own as far as how tired you get, you're done. You're done. I don't care how hard you can hit. You can only do that so long till you're out of breath. You see, sometimes that's what people... Uh, misrepresent when it comes to things like cycling, for example. People are like, oh, yeah, give me a good bike. Give me something that's worth a couple thousand dollars. Get me some Lycra and put that stuff on real good. I'm going to be, I'm going to ride down the road wide, slam open. Yeah, it's all good till you can't breathe anymore, right? you got to be able to breathe. And when you can't breathe, you can't fight. When you can't breathe, you can't pedal. You see, in the boxing world, here's what the greats say. Everybody has a plan till you get punched in the face. Everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face and you can't breathe anymore, right? And you're just war slap out. Let me tell you what happened to Moses. He got war slap out. His hands were up and the people were winning. And the problem is, and there's, there's, there's a lot here, but the problem is at times that everybody down below the mountain was excited over the fact that they were winning this unbelievable battle and did not realize that somebody on top of the mountain was having to pay the cost for them to win it. You see, everybody in this room is the result of somebody's prayer life. Every, everybody in this room is the result of somebody's intimacy with Jesus. Do you know that? All of you or where you are spiritually because somebody, as the old-timers say, prayed you through. 
some mama, some daddy, some grandparent, some t- tenacious bus worker. Somebody prayed you, some spouse, to where you are right now. Everyone in this room is a product of somebody holding up their hands for an extraordinarily long time when they were very, very tired. And so don't ever discount that fact. You are not where you are because you pulled yourself up by your bootstraps. You are where you are by the grace of God because God put people in your life to help you when you were helpless. And so here's Moses doing something that was powerful in the spirit realm, but naturally the people had no idea that their winning or the lack of their winning had anything to do with what this man of God on the hill was doing. So watch what happens. His hands are heavy, so what did they do? They took a stone, and they put it under him, and he sat there on. And Aaron and her stayed up his hands. The one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady, watch this, until the going down of the sun. Holy smokes, everybody in this room both needs and needs to be Aaron and her. Everyone in this room, including this cat with the microphone, needs some people that will hold up their arms when they are tired of fighting. Everybody needs that. If if you don't have friends like that, you don't know what friends are. If you don't have family like that, you've got people that are in your bloodline, but they're not your family. And how many know sometimes local church family is thicker and closer than blood kid family? That's the facts. And so here's Moses. We're not going to discount it. Man, this man of God was going. He's holding up their hands. They're winning. They're winning. Woo! He's getting a little weak. And maybe just momentarily he would just kind of put the staff down, shake it out. By the time he shook it out, 5,000 people died. He'd pick that staff back up. Woo! You ever seen any Mr. Beast videos where people standing in circles for like three days? That's harder than you think. It's hard to stay on your feet and keep your hands up. That's hard, right? And so every time his hands would go down, the people would be discomfited, the King James says, which literally means they would be destroyed. And so Aaron and her were there, and they're like, hey, we notice a spiritual phenomenon that has led to a physical phenomenon. When his hands are up, we win. When his hands are down, we lose. Which, by the way, I'll say this. It may sound self-serving, but it's the facts. Everything rises and falls on leadership. It was nobody else's hands that had to be raised up. It had to be the man of God's hands that were raised up. Okay? It had to be. And when his hands were raised... The people won the battle. You see, everybody wants to call the shots until they start shooting. Hmm? Everybody wants to make the rules until the world gets lawless. Everybody wants a position in front of people. But the only position in front of people that matters is if you live in a position and a posture of humility, reverence, and repentance before the Lord in intimacy every single day of your life. Because the greatest leaders you will ever meet are those that serve behind the scene when nobody's looking at them. And that's a whole other message in and of itself. There's a whole book in that. And so Aaron and her said, you know what? We've noticed that when his hands are up, we win. When his hands are down, we lose. So here's what we're going to do. They took a rock. And they positioned that rock behind Moses in such a way that Moses was able to sit down. You see, it wasn't his standing that allowed them to win. It was the raising of his hands in victory and defeat against the enemies that allowed them to win. So they set the man of God down, which no doubt would take some relief out of his lower back and out of his legs. But his hands still got heavy. And as his hands 
began to fall down, Aaron and her recognized the fact there is no way we can afford another loss of life on the battlefield. So here's what I do. I'll take the right side. You take the left side. Let's sit down beside him on this rock and prop up the man of God's hands. And, and, and watch what the ultimate result of this when they, when they did this. Check this out. I want you to look at verse uh, number 12. But Moses' hands were heavy. So what they do? Took a stone, put it under him. He sat there on. And Aaron and her stayed up, propped up, held up his hands, the one on the one side, the one on the other side, and his hands were steady, notice how long, until the going down of the sun. And result, Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this, shout this, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar in that spot. And he called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. For he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. We know how that turns out in First and Second Samuel. That's a whole other message for another time. But hear me and hear me well. Everyone in this room has a biblical mandate, gift, calling, responsibility to be an Aaron and a her. By the way, not just to me, to each other. To your spouse. You see... If we would lift up the hands of our spouse more than figuring out ways we could throw hands with our spouse, then we would find out that much of it is not about our spouse, but it's about the way we treat our spouse. And that was just free for the taking because one of the things you'll find in Ephesians chapter 5 is one of the biggest results of being filled with the Holy Spirit is wives submitting themselves to their husbands and husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church. If you... If you have a buck wild marriage, one of you, if not both of you, is not obeying the command to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Because a Holy Ghost filled individual will have a Holy Ghost filled marriage. Does that make sense? And so we've got to learn to prop each other up. And in the church world, we're the worst about kicking the props out from other people. You ever notice how people love failure? The church, pardon me for having to say it like this, but i got to shock you. The church is addicted to failure porn. We love it. I have been, look, I know people hate us. Dear God, I know it. Okay? But even I have been a little bit shocked at how many people in the media world have rejoiced over our tent collapsing. And I'm like, y'all sick. Yeah, y'all ain't got nothing better to do with your life than to hate on people just for the simple fact of hating on people. I've never seen people that are addicted to failure and calamity as much as this generation, this cancel culture. That'll do everything to cancel you, but if you turn the tables and try to cancel them, they cry foul, right? These people that scream tolerance have not an ounce of it. When the tables are turned. And so you have to understand that the church in the American landscape has been conditioned. We've been like taught to hate each other. No wonder people can't find friends at church. No, no wonder people get displaced and, and lost in the crack so easily in the church, especially in a larger congregation. It's because there's no real bond. There's no real connection because we're not used to propping people up. We're used to cutting people down. And we're quick to do it. You know what the Bible says about love? It thinketh no evil, but rejoices in the truth. If every time you hear something about somebody... You are quick to believe it without any facts. That's not biblical love. That has destroyed more churches than anything you could ever imagine. It's destroyed more homes, more young people, more student ministries, more college and career ministry. Uh, it's destroyed people's lives. We are quick to believe it because we're like, well, yeah, that must be true because so-and-so told me because I read it on Facebook. That's gospel. <laughs> what? Listen, what I want to be is a proper upper. 
I don't even know if that's a proper word, but it is now. I want to prop people up. You know why? Because the longer I'm in ministry, the more I recognize, man, people's arms are tired. I mean, if you have children, if you have children under the age of 18, right, like now, not you've, if, if they're out, thank God you've survived it somehow. If you have children under the age of 18, would you stand up just for a moment? Just, just for a moment. I want you to stand up just for a moment. Look at that room full of people. All right, now you can sit down. Let me tell you something. The fact that you could even stand is a miracle of God. <laughs> Listen, parenting is the toughest gig I've got. I can pastor people. I can fight the media all dadgum day, and I do. All right? We can put up with some crazy stuff. But dadding and momming, help me, Holy Ghost. So I think what the church has to understand is that people are exhausted. People are tired. Do you know we're clipping along in evangelical Christianity at a 75% divorce rate? People are exhausted. Pastors are exhausted. Churches are exhausted. Look, the fact that our church even exists is a miracle akin to the parting of the Red Sea. I mean, you people are as resilient as I am. Holy smokes, y'all are crazy. Y'all are the most Teflon people I've ever met in my life. <laughs> Honestly, I, I think, I, I was thinking the other day, I'm like, you know what? We need to have an award ceremony for every person that has ever survived at least six months at Global Vision Bible Church with me being their pastor. You need to have an award ceremony. It needs to be like, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. Because y'all crazy. I, I, I can't think of a church in America that has withstood more hell than this tent church we've got. It's crazy. So here's what I know as a shepherd. I'm not preaching this just for you to prop my arms up. I'm preaching this to remind me to prop your arms up and tell all of us, prop everybody's arms up in this house. We got to hold each other up. We got to hold each other accountable. We got to go to the next level. If we're going to survive what's coming, we got to put some rocks under some people and hold our arms up and say, I'm here for the long haul. I'm going to hold your hand literally the whole time. I'm here for the long haul. That's what family does. That's what church does. Matter of fact, you ought to read Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 6. They sold their possessions and goods, gave to every man as they had a need. They checked on each other. They loved each other. They blessed each other. They helped each other. You see, the American church has ruined itself because what it does is it puts one man at the top and says, we'll pay you to do the job that everybody in the church is supposed to be doing themselves. And so what happens is we burn this guy out just to swap him out for somebody else, and then nobody ever comes up in their gifts because at the end of the day, what I'm called to do is shepherd the leaders, and the leaders are to shepherd the people, and you better understand that you can't shepherd people if you don't love them well. So where all that came from, I don't know, but the idea, the principle is all of you are shepherds. You may not be a vocational pastor. That, that may not be your five-fold ministry gift and calling as far as a Pastor Greg or a Pastor Jesse. or no, no, but you still have a heart to shepherd people. And you can't shepherd them if you're not propping them up. And, and one of the things you're going to have to stop doing is listening to people that always want to knock people down. Stop. Cut them people out of your Facebook Get, get off Twitter if you have to. Quit reading that mess. Quit looking at that stuff. Quit hanging out with those people that all they ever do is talk trash about others. Because here's what I know about them. When you're not around, they talk trash about you. They sure do. They talk trash about you. Don't let them. Don't let them trash people. We're, we're done with those days, right? New year, new you. It's time to start propping folks up. You know how you're going to help people win the battle? Prop their arms up. Help them when they're hurting, when they're discouraged. When they're broke, man, I, here lately, I'm just, I'm meandering, I'm just talking. Here lately, 
I have just been, uh, I've been consumed with levels of generosity that I or we as a church family have not yet tapped into. And, and glaringly, we would have to say that well, most people would say we're probably the most generous church they've ever seen in the entirety of their life, right? And I, I, I want to be as close to the New Testament with generosity as possible. And we're like 7% there, right? And I've just, I've been consumed lately with the needs of other people. I've been seeing things so different lately. I don't even know what it is. It's, it's like God's given me a new set of, of like spiritual eyes. For example, you know, we, our, our church in the past has done a lot for uh, single moms, right? But I'm like, do you know how hard single parenting is? I mean, I, I get it. Single mom, single dad, they're both very tough gigs. Okay, I, I pulled the, the single fatherhood thing for a while, and it was not fun. But when I look at the landscape of single motherhood and the mission field of being overlooked that it has become in the American landscape, did you know I was reading the other day? Four out of ten people in Wilson County go to bed every night hungry. Not just our homeless friends. People live in apartments and houses and have jobs, but they can't pay their bills because the government can't get their crap together. Right? Don't get me started. And four out of ten people in Wilson County, USA, go to bed hungry tonight. And we eat good, dress well, have heat on at the house, sleep good, and get up grumpy every day. Walk around with the pooch mouth disease. Just looking for something to be mad at. Looking for something to be upset about. And four out of ten people in this town, one of the most affluent towns, will go to bed hungry tonight. And look, I'm not against churches having stuff. I'm against stuff having churches. And people can get mad at it. They can hate us all you want. Now, now look, 90% of the people that call today, all the people that hate us, they don't even live in this town. Sometimes we can get this idea, oh, my goodness, everybody in Mount Julia hates Global Vision. No, they don't. There's a lot more support in this town. All the hate comes from people outside of town. Hip Mount Julia just happens to be loud. Just happens to be loud. Which, by the way, let me share something about that. I'm just going to talk a little bit. I'm having a good time. <clears throat> There's this, this girl I'm not going to tell you who she is because God turned this whole thing around. She, she met my wife, and I don't necessarily want to, I don't want to give away who she is, so I don't want to tell you how she met my wife, but she's met my wife a few times, three times, in fact, okay, three times. And so, obviously, it's a reoccurring deal. Figured out. And she just recently told Ty, said, listen, I need to confess something to you. That's a rough one. Somebody says that to a preacher's wife, right? She said, I need to confess something to you. She said, I was one of those hip Mount Juliet people. She said, I hated you and your husband. She said, I said everything about y'all's church. And she said, I'm ashamed. Having got to know you, that I ever did such a thing. She said, my goodness, you are nothing like the media has portrayed you to be. Now listen, I didn't know any of this was going on. I didn't know these conversations had been, haven't had, okay? 
So I know where she was one day. And out of the blue, right, out of the blue, the Holy Spirit said in my heart, go buy your wife a cup of coffee. She, look, she barely even drinks coffee. Honestly, she'll get up, make one in the morning, and take two sips of it and give it to me. If she tells me to go to Dunkin', get the same thing you're going to get, I'm like, that's wonderful because I'm going to be drinking it. <laughs> you might as well drink what I like. You ain't going to drink it no how. The Holy Spirit says, go out of your way, buy her a coffee, and show up where she's at without letting her know and give it to her. I thought, that's weird. Who does that? Obedient husband, I guess. So I dropped what I was doing. I went out of my way. It's not like I didn't want to go to Dunkin' anyhow, right? So I went and got me one, and I thought, get her one. So I got her a coffee. And I thought, she's going to think this is the weirdest thing in the world. So I, I walked into this place where she was. I just walked through. And, hey, y'all, what's up? My wife's up in here somewhere. I went, and there she was. And I said, hey, babe, I felt like the Lord just wanted me to bring you a coffee. I leaned over, and I kissed her, and I walked out. What I didn't know was that when I did that, this woman's heart was changed. And she told my wife, when that man, she said, I was shocked when he walked in. When that man walked in and just gently came over and kissed you and handed you a coffee for no reason, Told you he loved you and just walked right on out, got in his vehicle and left. She said, I said to myself right there, if he treats his wife like that, he cannot be the monster that everybody on Hip Mount Juliet says he is. And all it took was for me getting a prompting for the Holy Spirit to go get my wife a cup of coffee. And for a lot of people, they're like, oh, that's no big deal. Well, she just don't drink it. And she did that day. <laughs> but if not, the Lord certainly used the obedience. What I'm saying is, if we would look for opportunities around us to see the brokenness in this community, it would shock us that the reason a lot of people are angry is for a reason they can't even tell you. They don't even know why they're mad. But I'll tell you why they're mad. Their hands are heavy. Can't pay their bills. Kids on dope. Marriage is a mess. If they even have a church, it's certainly not a family. They feel alone. They feel ostracized. Life is just kind of robotic. You just get up, go to work, be miserable, come home, be more miserable, go to bed. Only not to sleep, to wake up, be more tired, more exhausted, start the whole routine over again. People's hands are heavy. You have a job tonight. Same job I have. Push a rock under some people. Prop their arms up. Listen to them. You have two ears and one mouth. You should use these twice as much as you use this. Quick to hear, slow to speak. Quick to hear, slow to speak. And to be slow to speak, the Bible says in Proverbs, will be slow to wrath. Because a fool lets it all out. But if we understood, I want you to think about just tonight in this room. In this makeshift worship center. The level of heavy-handedness just in this house right now. Do you understand that in this room right now, we represent a massive amount of cases of brokenness, insomnia, sickness, surgeries, hurt, bankruptcy, Lack of job stability. And we walk around sometimes like we're 10 foot tall and bulletproof and speak to people like they're dogs. 
when the only thing a person sometimes, even somebody that gets on your nerves, get over it. They're not getting on your nerves. You're getting on your own nerves. Love people. Prop their arms up. There's times we got to rebuke people. I get it. There's times we got to do our due diligence, got to clean house. I get it. But by and large, so many problems in the American landscape and certainly in the American church could be fixed if we would just hold each other up instead of tearing each other down. Life is heavy. You understand that? Life's heavy. And so when life's already heavy and then all of a sudden heavy stuff starts happening, man, it gets worse real quick. Things can compound. I have a responsibility to you and you have a responsibility to me and we have a responsibility to each other and that's to prop each other up because when we prop up others, God will prop us up. You see, for a while you'll feel like you're standing by yourself, but after a while God will give you some people that will come and stand with you. You see, for a while, you'll be Daniel all by yourself, but pretty soon, God will give you a Shadrach, a Meshach, and a Abednego. For a while, you'll be a Paul, and then God will bring you a Barnabas. And don't ever forget the people in your life that became a Barnabas when the rest of the disciples forsook you and thought you were crazy. So I'm just, I'm just talking tonight, right? Just chatting a little bit with our folks. Because there's a lot of arm heaviness in this room. And people watching online. Listen, you would be uh, shocked. You'd be shocked at the number of pastors that I counsel every week that are on the absolute verge of not just quitting, utter burnout and ministerial ruin. I mean, I, I'll be honest. Sometimes I feel guilty because I have more on a list that I can't get to of pastors that reach out for whatever reason. For whatever reason. And... I told Ty the other day, I said, you know what we ought to do? I said, we ought to have a, a gathering just for pastors and their wives have absolutely zero responsibility for them to have to do anything. And I'm going to call the conference exhausted. <laughs> and any pastor and his wife that's exhausted, just show up. You think the deliverance conference was big. They're all exhausted. Yeah. And they're, I mean, just people are wore out. I see one of my good friends back here in the back. I thought I saw you back there, golfer man. How you doing? T am I telling the truth? Pastors are wore out. We are wore out. And pastors are quitting at an alarming rate. Now, look, quit's not in me, as you can tell, Okay. They, they, they literally are going to roll the tanks up. And they go say, well, well, you know, we're going to get you on a January 6th technicality. You're going to go to jail. Well, I'll start a jail ministry. <laughs> <laughs> they, they probably won't let me live stream, so you guys got it. So y'all just, till, till they arrest you, you preach, then you preach, and you preach. We, we got plenty of preachers to go around. We'll be all right. We'll just keep going, keep going, keep going. But I'm saying, look. It, it, it's not that I got some, you know, supernatural thing that other people don't have, but but sometimes people just don't have tenacity to, to stick it out like that, right? I just have a I have a stubbornness. I have a supernatural stubbornness. But not everybody has that grit. And there are pastors all over the world, not just America, right now. There's guys watching us right now. That if they could quit and not feel guilty. They would have done it six months ago. The guilt that pastors have when they call me, it is unbearable. Remember what Paul said? Paul said, I got this, I got this, I got this, and they tried to stone me, they tried to kill me, they tried to do this, and then he said this, comma, and the care of the churches 
that presses upon me daily. Hmm. It's not about a pulpit. If it's all just about a pulpit, you'll be out quick. It's about a passion. And I'm saying tonight a lot of things. But amongst many things. And you can go ahead and start tickling them ivories. I feel it. Praise God. I think some of you just need to really ask God tonight to help you be a proper upper. Some of you need to get to a place where you say, Lord, forgive me for not looking out for others more than I have. Some of you tonight need to encourage people that are in this room right now. Some of you need to send an email. Some of you, listen, it wouldn't offend me one bit if you'd pull your cell phone out right now and text somebody just to encourage them and let them know, especially if you know someone in the ministry. If you know a pastor, you know a worship leader, you, you know somebody that's leadership at a church, you, you know somebody that's in the thick of it, and not just ministry folks, we all get it. But you could pull your phone out right now and just send them a text and say, I want you to know I love you. Some of you need to learn to hold up people's hands better. Because what happens is when you don't go through life holding up everybody else, you feel defeated and lonely and isolated when nobody comes around to hold your hands up. And it's heavy. It's heavy. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to bow your heads just for a moment. And I want you to hold both hands up in the air and stand to your feet. Heads bowed, eyes closed, stand to your feet, both hands up in the air. Here's what I want you to think about. Visualize this in your heart. As long as them hands are up, The body of Christ prevails. The church advances and moves forward. But let's be honest. In five minutes from now, half the hands would be lowered, not because you're evil, but because you get heavy. And I wonder right now if you just wouldn't use this as your opportunity to cry out to the Lord and say, God, help me tonight. To come alongside people and lift up their hands. Lift up the hands of people in our church. Lift up the hands of my boss. Lift up the hands of leadership around me. Lift up the hands of our pastors. Lift up the hands of their spouses. Lift up the hands of the worship team. The Levites. See, after a while, them hands get heavy. Them shoulders start getting tight. You ain't got nothing in your hand. Ooh, that back starts getting tight. Them legs start going numb. You need to feel that. You can put your hands down. As we're bowed before the Lord. Man, the Lord threw a curveball tonight. Which took us a whole new direction. So many things I could say, want to say, probably should say. But I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to make you a promise. This year, I'm going to be more keenly aware of people around me with heavy hands, with extra burdens. Look, you see somebody, their face is toward the ground, shoulders are kind of drooping. Just walk up to them, put your hand on their shoulder and say, I want you to know, I appreciate you. You may be the very moment that that man or that woman or that young person was begging God for. Just in that moment. And I want to say this just before we pray. And then maybe 
as we're being dismissed. Maybe you just want to go around encouraging people all over the room. Wouldn't bother me one bit. We got this room till 10 o'clock. You can encourage as many people as you want to. I don't have time tonight to walk up and down these aisles and call every name, appreciate every person. Obviously, lately, prophetically, there's been times God specifically told me to do certain things and we've begun to flow in that and God honors it. But I want to prophetically say over everybody, everybody in this room tonight, every one of you that have stuck by the stuff you've ignored the hate you keep showing up you serve behind the scenes nobody knows it you open doors you shake hands you work on the deliverance team you pray for people you help in the baptismal lines you're serving water serving coffee fixing the tent working on security Walk around a parking lot, parking cars, fixing cones, deleting stupidity on the live stream, setting up cameras, setting up keyboards, drum sets, sweeping steps, putting out prayer cards, and a thousand other things, many of which I don't even know. I say to every one of you tonight God sees you he sees you tonight he sees you you didn't even have that $20 bill to give that woman but you gave it You didn't even hardly have the ability to help that person, but you helped them. Shoveled snow, bought somebody gas, showed up at a hotel tonight that's been threatened six ways from Sunday, but you showed up just to be just to be with your family tonight. God sees you. God's pleased with you. God loves you. And if nobody's told you lately, I deeply appreciate you. Pastoring would be a lonely gig with no sheep. Lonely gig. I'm not called to preach to a mirror. And the fact that you keep showing up and you keep serving and you keep putting up with unbelievable odds that so much of the average church would never even have to experience, much less endure on a regular basis. I just want you to know I deeply appreciate you. And I want to spend my life propping up your arms. You spend your life propping up my arms. And I'm going to tell you something. You Malachites don't have a chance. They don't have a chance. Well, Pastor Jesse, won't you come grab this mic and pray for us, dear brother, as we are dismissed tonight. And again, I want you to just get around and love each other. Just get around and encourage each other. And uh, we'll get this cash all tallied up. We'll bless these people here. Even the, even the ones that were answering phones earlier that aren't here now, we'll make sure that the, uh, the general manager gets them what they need. And we'll be a be a blessing to them so you let them know every every worker you see around I know there's probably not many of them left but I know there's several you let them know how much you deeply appreciate them letting us gather here tonight and let's leave the place better than we found it find any trash and where throw it away and I, I know they they clean that kind of stuff but I, I want us to clean it I want us to leave it better than we found it and by the way they gave us all of this for free refused to allow us to pay anything and so that was a blessing so Pastor Jesse you pray for us and then when he says amen, you can be dismissed. They can sing. They can shout. You can get around. Do whatever you want to. But I love you guys. And we will see you Saturday night for the reading. We will see you under the tent at 1030 Sunday morning. 
And we're going to see what the Lord will do. Amen. Father, thank you so much for the message that you laid on pastor's heart. May we encourage each other. May we lift each other up. May we hold each other's arms up. May we continue to do that here in this church and at home, Father. I pray that you just move mightily through our, through our, uh, throughout our lives, Father. I pray that you just move mightily tonight through, throughout people's vehicles on the way home, Father. I pray that you fill their, their living rooms with the presence of the Holy Spirit so that they can encourage one another, encourage their spouse, encourage their children, encourage those around them. May, may every person here just, just, take what pastor spoke and, and, and just text somebody tonight and say, hey, I'm thinking about you and I just want you to know that I'm holding your arms up and I'm standing behind you and I'm fighting in the trenches with you. <laughs> Father, may we all just take that to heart and Father, I pray that you just move mightily in, in, in our midst and, and continue to, to lift us up and lift our spirits, Father, and, and continue to to, to just guide us along even when we're down. When we get kicked down, Father, I pray that you just give us the strength and, and just send your warrior angels to fight on our behalf, to help us. But most of all, may we help each other. Through these tough times, Father, I pray that you just, you, you, you continue to, to just show up like you always do and, and, and mesmerize us with your miracles. We thank you for trusting us with so much, Father. We ask that you continue to trust us, continue to grow our congregation, continue to grow our relationships as a church family closer and closer and closer together, Father. I pray that you just bless that. Bring unity amongst the brethren, Father. I pray that you just bring unity in our homes, unity in our church. Continue to bless each and every family here, Father. I pray for every need that needs to be met. I pray for everybody traveling home, Father, tonight, that you, you, bl you bless that and you just watch over them, get them home safely, each and every person. I pray that they get home safely tonight. Thank you so much, Father, for everything that you're doing and you're going to continue doing. We love you, we praise you, and we worship you in this place. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.